There's a pretty one, Ulysses. Hello Booktube, I'm Sean the Book Maniac. Welcome back to my channel. Here I am with a review of a novel that I read for Victober in 2020. The novel is called Halbeck of Bannistale, and the author is very sexistly referred to as Mrs. Humphrey Ward, and her husband didn't even know how to spell Humphrey, but she, let's give her her due, her name is, was Mary Augusta Ward, and this is an 1898 novel. And uh, let me give you a little bit of personal background. I picked this book up. I will put a link in the show notes if you're curious to see the used bookstore in Saskatchewan, Canada, where I bought this about a year and a half ago. And that was a real experience because it is, unfortunately, since I visited that bookstore, that jovial, eccentric bookstore owner has passed away and the bookstore is no more but it was the most cluttered, disorganized dog's breakfast of a bookstore that I've ever been in. And it was so crowded that I, with, with my large body, I couldn't actually go down most of the rows of bookshelves. But I did find this and a couple other books. And I'd, I'd heard of Mrs. Humphrey Ward, but this novel, the title meant nothing to me. And it's a penguin, fairly yellowed pages. And I read the back, and it said it, it reflected the religious preoccupations of the period. And it's about a young woman whose Catholic lover wants her to conform to his traditional views. That didn't sound very interesting, to be honest. And then I didn't look up any information on Mary Augusta Ward until I was actually filming my Victober TBR video, and I discovered that she... Mary Augusta Ward was active in not the suffragist movement. She died in 1920, and she was active not in the suffragist movement. She was active in the anti-suffragist movement in the UK. And I was like, what? I don't think I want to read a book about women being pressured to conform to traditional roles by an anti-suffragist novelist of any gender. So I had the lowest of expectations for this novel. And it should also be said at the outset that I am completely allergic to religious themes in fiction. Like, get your religion out of my fiction. I'm a little more open to non-Christian religions, but uh, Christianity, Christian fiction, belongs in a special section in the Bible bookstore. It does not belong with literary novels. For example, Marilyn Robinson. She's way too churchy for me, and uh, some of Anthony Trollope's as well. Anyway, so yes, I have high sensitivity to religious themes in fiction. And I am delighted to tell you that this was the surprise of my Victober reading month. It was a five-star read. I absolutely loved it. Let me tell you why. The main characters are Halbeck, Alan Halbeck, and his the, the neighborhood that he lives in in the UK is Bannisdale. Alan Halbeck is a Catholic and has come from a Catholic family that goes way back in history in that area, and his family had been persecuted to the max in the early days after Henry VIII, you know, all that stuff. Alan Halbeck was a very devout Catholic living in an extremely anti-Catholic neighborhood and had suffered violence at the hands of anti-Catholic neighbors a decade or so before. And 20 years before the novel opens, something like that, his sister married an Anglican by birth who was agnostic or atheist. And Alan Halbeck was so upset he disowned his sister and there was no contact between them. And that sister, Augustina Halbeck, whose married name was Augustino Fountain, she raises her new atheist husband, Stephen Fountain's daughter. From a previous marriage, he was a widower, and the daughter, Laura Fountain, was a young girl when they married, and so she raised her as her own. As this novel opens, Stephen Fountain, the atheist brother-in-law, has died. The sister, Augustina Fountain, Nee Helbeck, is quite ill, and she reaches out to her brother, Augustina, and her... I forget, 19, 20-year-old stepdaughter, Laura Fountain, are arriving at the brother, Alan Halbeck's estate. And he's very nervous. He hasn't seen his sister in 20 years, but he's in a forgiving state of mind. He knows already that his 
step niece. His sister's stepdaughter, Laura, is not religious at all. And he's nervous about that. That is the opening to the novel, and it's not a spoiler to say that eventually Helbeck, Alan Helbeck and Laura... I should say Alan Helbeck is not like 60, he's 37, I think. That he and Laura end up becoming lovers and getting engaged. I'm not going to say anything more about where that plot line goes, but that's the part about a Catholic lover requires the this young woman to accept the role that his traditions impose. That is, I would say, a misnomer or far too simplistic, because why I love this novel is that, and I'm going to share the scene where we first meet... Laura. Laura was the heart and soul of this novel, and whatever Augusta Ward's anti-suffragist views, she was a Victorian novelist, she wrote into the Edwardian and Georgian era, I think, that created fully realized characters, and in Laura Fountain has created as memorable a female heroine as anything in that those Bronte ladies did. I'm not comparing the novel to a Bronte novel, but certainly the character of Laura Fountain will stay with me as long as Jane Eyre or any other feisty British Victorian heroine you could think of. I love this novel because Ward portrays Laura's absence of faith and the way that she falls in love with Alan Helbeck. That conflict was so protracted and embodied and lived out in every interaction. It was not merely, there's a lot of intellectual stuff about religion in here, and I'm a guy that gets so turned off by that, and I was riveted. Alan Helbeck was so religious that there's actually a church right on his farm, <laughs> and there's priests and nuns, and he's doing all these good works all over the UK and Europe, Catholic orphanages and stuff, and he's selling anything of value in his house or on his estate, bit by bit, to give it to these Catholic charities that he's involved in. So he is devout, he is a stick in the mud, he seems a lot older than he is, and Laura and he, you know, opposites attract, and it is a, a love story, and I don't like love stories in fiction, I expect them in Victorian fiction, but this one captured my heart. I w was a sucker for every turn and fight and misunderstanding that was narrated so beautifully. I don't think that Augusta Ward is an incredibly beautiful writer, but she is a powerful writer and made these characters come alive for me. There's a lot of drama. I'm not sure all of the dramatic scenes needed to be there or that they were explored in the aftermath of these dramatic incidents as much as they could have been, but I love this novel. I don't know exactly when this was set, but as I said, it was published in 1898. The psychological depth at which these characters were rendered on the page just made it. I, I was just shocked at how deeply I fell into the novel and how much I ended up loving it. I was interested in all the religious stuff far more than I thought I would. Give Mary Augusta Ward her due that she made me care about Catholic Anglican disagreements in late Victorian Britain. But I also kept thinking about more modern versions of this story, political disagreements within families or between lovers, anything to do with race, gender, being queer, that I could access through the way that this story was made so palpable and relevant to me as a aging early 21st century dude who is quite captivated by the way those kind of social political conflicts get worked out in relationships and this novel just sang just was vibrating with all of those energies and quite a bit of intellectual theological stuff but because the characters were so deeply realized on the page, I could accept and entertain and try to digest all of it and had such a good time doing so. But Laura Fountain, boys and girls, she's one of my favorite Victorian heroines. She was so passionate and endearing and mischievous and just the way that she could make the old poop much older than his 37-year-old poop, Alan Helbeck, start to laugh and giggle and play games. 
it was joyful to read. I don't know how easy this... I don't think this is in print. I think there's, you can get it on certain internet bookstores that I won't mention the name of as ebook or whatever, and maybe print on demand, but I, I don't think it would be expensive for you to get a copy of this. You might find a copy used, but I really recommend it. Nobody, I've never heard anybody talk about this novel, and I'm going to be talking about it from here on in, so please consider putting it on your Victober DBR for next year. Just a couple things about Mary Augusta Ward. She was interesting. So she was born in 1851 in Tasmania, Australia. That's where her family was living, but they moved back to the UK when she was uh, only six years old. Her father, Tom Arnold, was an English prof or English teacher. By the way, her, she was Mary Augusta Arnold and came from a very intellectual lit literary family, which I'll get to in a minute. But part of the germ of this story comes from the fact that her father converted to Catholicism when she was just a young child, and her mother refused to. I haven't gone down the, the biographical rabbit hole any more than that, but from what's mentioned in the introduction in the Wikipedia page, certainly that would be the biographical spark for this story. A little bit more about her background. Her uncle was the poet Matthew Arnold, and her grandfather was Thomas Arnold, who that name doesn't mean anything to me, but he was the famous headmaster of the rugby school. I don't think that's a school where you learn how to play rugby. I think it might be something different than that. Her sister, Julia, was married to Leonard Huxley. Who were they? I, I They were the fathers of Julian and Al Aldous Huxley. Lots of literary stuff going on in the whole background. She married her husband when she was 20, Humphrey Ward, a writer and editor and a fellow of Bra Bra Brasnos? Brasnos College. Uh, anyway, I want to know a whole bunch more about her, and I want to know if any of you have read anything by Mary Augusta Ward and whether you'd recommend it. In the little bit of reading up I've done on her, it seems like this might be the one novel that's worthy of, you know, still being read today, but I don't know. Please give me some comments. So here is where Augustina and her stepdaughter Laura first arrive at Bannisdale. The horses stopped and out sprang the girl. Wait a moment, let me help you, Augustina. How do you do, Mr. Halbeck? Don't touch my dog, please. She doesn't like men. Fricka, be quiet! For the little black spit she held in a chain had begun to growl and bark furiously at the first sight of Halbeck, to the evident anger of the old housekeeper, who looked at the dog sourly as she went forward to take some bags and rugs from her master. Halbeck, meanwhile, and the young girl helped another lady to alight. She came out slowly with the precaution of an invalid, and Halbeck gave her his arm. At the top of the steps, she turned and looked round her. Oh, Alan, she said, it's so long. Her lips trembled and her head shook oddly. She was a short woman with a thin, plaintive face and a nervous jerk of the head, always very marked at a moment of agitation. As he noticed it, Helbeck felt times long past rush back upon him. He laid his hand over hers and tried to say something, but his shyness oppressed him. When he had led her into the broad hall with its firelight and stuccoed roof, she said, turning round with the same bewildered air, You saw Laura? You, you have never seen her before. Oh, yes, we shook hands, Augustina, said a young voice. Will Mr. Halbeck please help me with these things? She was laden with shawls and packages, and Halbeck hastily went to her aid. In the emotion of bringing his sister back into the old house, which she had left fifteen years before, when he himself was a lad of two and twenty, he had forgotten her stepdaughter. But Miss Fountain did not intend to be forgotten. She made him relieve her of all burdens, and then argue an overcharge with the fly man. And at last, when all the luggage was in and the fly was driving off, she mounted the steps deliberately, looking about her all the time, but principally at the house. The eyes of the housekeeper, who with Mr. Helbeck was standing in the entrance, awaiting her, surveyed both dog and mistress with equal disapproval. But the dusk was fast passing into darkness, and it was not till the girl came into the brightness of the hall, where her stepmother was already sitting, tired and drooping, on a settle near the great wood fire, that Helbeck saw her plainly. She was very small and slight, and her hair made a spot of pale gold against the oak panelling of the walls. 
Helbeck noticed the slenderness of her arms and the prettiness of her little white neck, then the freedom of her quick gesture as she went up to the elder lady and with a certain peremptoriness began to loosen her cloak. Augustina ought to go to bed directly, she said, looking at Helbeck. The journey tired her dreadfully. Mrs. Fountain's room is quite ready, said the housekeeper, holding herself stiffly behind her master. She was a woman of middle age with a pinkish face, framed between two tiers of short gray curls. Laura's eye ran over her. You don't like our coming, she said to herself. Then to Helbeck, may I take her up at once? I will unpack and put her comfortable. Then she ought to have some food. She's had nothing today but some tea at Lancaster. Mrs. Fountain looked up at the girl with feeble acquiescence, as though depending on her entirely. Helbeck glanced from his pale sister to the housekeeper in some perplexity. Well, what will you have? he said nervously to Miss Fountain. Dinner, I think, was to be at a quarter to eight. That was the time I was ordered, sir, said Mrs. Denton. Can't it be earlier? asked the girl impetuously. Mrs. Denton did not reply, but her shoulders grew visibly rigid. Do what you can for us, Denton, said her master hastily, and she went away. Helbeck bent kindly over her sister. You know what a small establishment we have, Augustina. Mrs. Denton, a rough girl, and a boy, that's all. I do trust they will be able to make you comfortable. Oh, let me come down when I have unpacked and help cook, said Miss Pouton brightly. I can do anything of that sort. Helbeck smiled for the first time. I'm afraid Mrs. Denton wouldn't take it kindly. She rules us all in this old place. I dare say, said the girl quietly. It's fish, of course, she added, looking down at her stepmother and speaking in a meditative voice. It's a Friday's dinner, said Helbeck, flushing suddenly and looking at his sister. Except for Miss Fountain, I supposed. Mrs. Fountain rose in some agitation and threw him a piteous look. All right, just a little taste. If that sounds good, please try Halbeck of Bannisdale by Mary Augusta Ward. Thanks for watching. Oh.